come. It's just, uh, I, I, I get excited every time I hear um, this young man speak. <laughs> I say that, you know, it's like, um, you know, as I get older and I see these young guys, you know, and see Pastor Garth and Carol and, you know, the Lyles, and who's now over middle-aged, but um, <laughs> which I tease them about. Um, you know, these guys who started with youth and all those kind of things, but now Andrew has a ministry that um, uh, is Andrew Stone Ministries, and so he travels, he's been in the States this year, he's been all around Australia, he's been in New Zealand, and uh, all of those kind of things, and so he's continuing to go out, this is what he and Ali do, and uh, so tonight we're going to take up an offering for them, if you're not able to be here tonight and you want to sow into his ministry, uh, if POS is available and uh, maybe we can make a, um, something available at the table outside as well. Uh, there is some great product out there. I want you to put your hands together and give Pastor Andrew Stone a great welcome back yeah. to Invercargo. Great to it's have true. You. Come on. Very good. You know, it's been like six weeks since I've been here. That's how much I love it. And uh, I came as my wife's baggage handler. Um, I just carried her bags, um, bought her food. She said, I feel like KFC. I said, I'll go get it for you. You're the speaker. I'm just the help. And uh, so I just wanted to... It's been so good to see her um, minister this weekend. I was up in the mother's room just for some of it, and I was just blessed. Um, And, you know, it has been such an intriguing journey. Let me just give you a little bit of history so you understand. The intriguing journey is that Ian and Dale have played such a pivotal point and part in our lives, not just the one-off, but the continual voice. Um, Sometimes you get ministered to in a moment, and then sometimes you get ministered in that moment that becomes a movement of some sort. And a relationship that is more than just, say, the laying on of hands. And I've had many great men and women of God lay hands on us, but very rarely do you continue a relationship that sees the fullness of things come through. Does that make sense? And, uh, and Ian and Dale have been so pivotal in our lives in this ministry. Not only were they the ones that prophesied this ministry before anybody else did, um, and accurately too, um, not just, oh, we see a new season. Praise the Lord for the new season words, but we actually got greater clarity than that. Uh, and, and so one of the first voices that spoke in Allison's life was Dale. When we first came on staff, we, were, we didn't know anything, and we still don't know that much, but we still, but we didn't know, which pastor really knows what they're doing? Let's be really honest. We just jump in the river. You know what I mean? We just jump in the river and let it, let's go with the flow here. And, you know, we, we, we had just started youth, and I remember Ian and Dale speaking into our lives, and it's just been so powerful, and to be here continually, this is like a family to me. I know so many of you, actually, that it's just like coming home. And that, that's why it's so comfortable for us to be here together and for Allison to be here and minister at the Women's Conference. And it's just been so great to see that gathering. But, but also, people just assumed Ali had been here before. Yeah. People were like, Ali's been here before. And I'm like, no, she hasn't. She'd have more warm clothes if she'd been here before. <laughs> she, she, she'd never been here. But it's, it, it was like spirit. And, and that's what we're really talking about. And today, we're going to go on a journey, you know, this morning and tonight on something that I'm seeing shift in the kingdom. This is a conversation more than just a clean cut preach. Is that okay? Because I actually feel that there's a kingdom movement. And when you understand the movement, see, the kingdom's not a moment, it's a movement. And you have to understand that when you get into the movement of the kingdom, where we get to call the king dad, it's actually a family movement and family journey. So if we can do that together, we're going to have some fun. It's like one big sermon that I'm just going to cut in half and then finish it tonight. This morning, I want to talk about identity. And tonight, I want to talk about the authority that comes with the identity. See, it's like love without power isn't love. But power without love is dangerous. It's the same thing with identity. That identity... Like, right, like I'm talking sonship in the kingdom, gender inclusive, of course, but sonship in the kingdom without authority yeah. is not sonship. Yeah. Yeah. But authority without sonship and identity is dangerous. Yeah. We've seen this. Yeah. We've seen it. The gift speaks for itself, and everyone's like, wow, look at the gift. But because there is no connection to Father, just a manifestation of a gift, yeah. people get hurt. Yeah. 
See, when you minister a gift to, 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 to see the wholeness of it, not just healing, but wholeness of it, you have to do it with the Father's heart. There's a paradigm shift that is happening, and this is what we're going to talk about, that I've seen in the kingdom. I'm not the only one that's seeing it. Um, you guys know Mike Connell. He's seeing the same thing. There are prophetic voices all over the world. Bethel's caught this. There are prophetic visions happening all over the world where we have to move from a discipleship mindset to a sonship mindset. And this is why discipleship is not bad. Jesus uses those particular words. You know, go into all the nations making disciples. So discipleship isn't, oh my goodness, I just don't want to disciple anybody anymore. No, discipleship is a function. Discipleship is a function, not a relationship. Let me, let me explain. Elijah had many disciples but one son. Right? All of them could do what he did, but only one carried his heart. I have had to minister, and I've had the privilege of ministering to, in, in churches where I'm actually, I'm usually the youngest in the meeting, just in meetings with staff, etc. I preach for people that I'm young enough to be their son, sometimes their grandson. I'm, just, I'm not young enough to be a grandson, you know what I mean? But, but, but the fact is, is that when it comes to, we're, we're seeing this journey, and this is what some people are discussing, is why would, and in the last year, or in the last few months in my travels, I've seen three churches whose main youth pastor, who is very charismatic, he's very gifted, split the church three times this year. And it's because they carry this amazing ability of their lead, of the, of the senior pastor, but they don't carry his heart. Any, anybody ever seen people that have this amazing ability, but then they don't, they don't see with the same eyes? See, so Elijah had many disciples, but one son. It's because disciples carry the ability of their leader, but sons carry the heart of their leader. And what I'm saying is this, is that ability comes with the heart. If you capture the heart of your leader, you're going to get the, the ability anyway. But you can hunger for the ability. And th those disciples of Elijah didn't want to look for what Elijah would see. But they just wanted the gift. And this is something that I think is my generation needs to capture. Because disciples always want a job. They always want a job. They always want to earn something. Sons want an inheritance. Sons receive an inheritance. I was speaking with Ian and Dale this week. And I was talking about why I've had so much favor in Australia. And I couldn't figure out why until just on the plane over and... I was suddenly realizing that it's because of my slipstream of inheritance. Now, you know that my spiritual granddad is Clark Taylor. And I've, I, still, I came off a trip just in Sydney two days before I came here. We did a conference together. And what I'm saying is that it is unheard of. Let me just put the miracles out there now. It is unheard of for a 29... I'm 30 now. But when I started, I was 28, traveling full-time. It's unheard of of someone in their 20s traveling full-time in Australia... And not having to go to America to make a living. It's true. And I suddenly realized why I'm Australia and New Zealand. Now, I do go to America. But Australia and New Zealand have been so key to this ministry. It's because I have an inheritance in both. That's, that's, that's not just favor. There's provision that comes along with that. Because my spiritual granddaddy made room. See, I don't want to be Clark's disciple. I want to be in his sonship line. I don't want to just carry his ability to drop people at an altar. <laughs> You've seen it. The leg and everything. And that Mike has magical powers. And it happens. I don't want to just carry that. Because you know what? That's okay. But I, when he prays for the sick, I want to carry that heart. I want to see that compassion flow out of me like it flows out of him. That he would spend two hours after a meeting praying for that lady in the wheelchair. See, that's the heart, not just an ability. See, Jesus didn't just have the Father's ability. 
He had his heart. So when Jesus is being baptized, he said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say, This is my beloved apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist. He said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The reason I bring that up is because as a minister, I have been so caught up in people putting me in a box. And I'm young enough to be, be spoken to by people with really good hearts who always try to prophesy into my life. And they'll say this, man, you are just such an evangelist. You're such a young evangelist. And the only reason they call me an evangelist is because I'm not on full-time staff at a church. So because I travel, I'm an evangelist. But then I might teach the word in in a different church. Oh, well, you were such a teacher. Praise the Lord for that. But they might see me move in, in the prophetic. Well, you're a prophet. You have the office of this. You have the office of that. You have the office of this. I don't want an office. I want the throne room. I don't want an office. That's for workers. Workers and servants and slaves get offices. Sons get the daddies. Presents. You capture this? And unless we get, we don't have provision issues. We have position issues. That's it. Money's not our issue, nor is healing, nor is any of it. It's finding ourselves in the identity of son. That we have to worry. So I want to declutter. Like I've uncluttered and decluttered God's love as much as I can. And I found that in that journey, we've had to come to a place of, I am loved by God because I'm a child of God. I bear his image and carry his name. And whatever name, now I want you to see this. Remember Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name. So when Jesus says that, when we pray in the name of Jesus, it's not just a cute line at the end of a, of, a, of a prayer. You know, so we pray something ridiculous and go, in the name of Jesus. And we hope that it works then. Because we sealed it right. In the name of Jesus is not a cute way to end your prayer to make sure it gets done in heaven. In the name of Jesus, I want you to catch this because it'll change your life. In the name of Jesus is the abandonment of self and removing that of its inferior identity and stepping into that of the superior identity. So when I pray in the name of Jesus, I'm exchanging myself and stepping into my true identity. Now, when I pray, that's why he said, whatever you ask in my name, it's found in John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, and he repeats it twice. Whatever you ask in my name, it shall be done. It shall be done. Because when we exchange the identity of us for the identity of him, we now will ask only what Jesus would ask. Because that's what we all get worried about when people pray in the name of Jesus. Well, but what if they ask for something that Jesus doesn't want to give them? Well, I'll tell you right now, if you carry the heart of Jesus, a heart of a son... You're not asking for something that the Father's not going to give. Because remember, it's not just about ability. It's about sonship. And it's about framing it in a way that we can actually receive freely from this inheritance that we have. So if we can go to um, Acts 3, 1 to 6, let's just start there. If we bring that up on the screen, I think it's slide 4. Now, Peter and John, so this is Acts 3, 1 to 6. We'll just skip down. They're here this time, so I don't have to show the picture of them. You can see them later in the foyer. Let's go down here. Let's go back one up. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. Let's go to the next slide. Who seeing Peter and John about to go... To go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Just rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What's the shifting of identity there? In the name, I suddenly now am exchanging my name for his name. See, it's his name that carries the weight. 
Will you remember that? If you prayed in the name of Andrew Stone, nothing's going to happen. I, God did not make a covenant with me to save the world. Aren't you glad? He didn't make a covenant with me. He didn't make a covenant with humanity. He made a covenant with himself. But he put a name to it. He put a name to it. The name that signs the covenant is the name that has all the authority, but also all the responsibility. If God made a covenant with me, it meant that when I prayed, I'd have to pray in the name of Andrew Stone. So would you. But it wasn't my blood that sealed the covenant. It was the blood of Jesus. That's why when I pray in the name of Jesus, I'm exchanging the, my inferiority for his superiority because his name is the one that carries the authority and the responsibility now. You see that? Okay. My foundational thought is here. Is sons can have a servant heart, but servants can't have a son's heart. Because Jesus washed the disciples when you read about it in John. You realize that he said, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. And therefore, I shall wash your feet. That's what he says. So Jesus served from a place. Jesus served as a king. He didn't serve to be king. So that's something that when we, when we minister, you're not ministering to get something else out of heaven. You're not ministering to get a greater miracle so you can say, Jesus, check this out. What are you doing? You're taking the full authority of the king and you're serving because you have been given all things, not to get. Because you've already been given all. We're too busy trying to get stuff when we've already been given stuff. Luke 12, 32. Let's have a look here. It says, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Doesn't say it, is the, it doesn't even say it is the Lord's good pleasure. It doesn't say it is the king's good pleasure. It says the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why? Because we have to relate to God as father so that we can inherit something that only a family member can. See, servants, slaves, and sons don't receive an inheritance. Sorry, servants, slaves, and workers don't receive an inheritance. They receive what? Wages. Because they earn it, therefore they receive wages. But a son always receives an inheritance. And it's the father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. I, want to, I don't want to rob that pleasure of daddy. Yeah. Very good. I'm just going to stop fighting. You know, th- there's that scripture, be still and know that he is God. Or be still and know that I am God. That's what, he, that's what the scripture says. But if you were to break it down, it's to be still and know. And then I just want to be. That's it. The first word of that scripture is just be. And the mystics actually would look at that scripture and they'd go, be still and know that I am God. A Franciscan monk did this breakdown in a devotional once. He said, be still and know that I am God. He said, and then when you know that he is God, you can just be. The mystics got something. In Matthew 18, 3, I just want to position you so that even tonight we're going to have signs, wonders, and miracles. But I don't, want to just, I don't want to just talk about the gift of it. I want to talk about the identity that comes along. The gift is an outworking of who you are. Not an outworking to get to know who you are. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that word enter in the Greek means possess. You will never possess the kingdom of heaven unless you fully understand that you need to change and become like a child. Why? Because children understand that daddy's got everything under control. My observation is this. The kingdom is an inheritance given to children. Let that just sit in your spirit. That it is an inheritance given to children. You're not asking for it. It's already been freely given. You just have to stop, breathe, and receive. Just receive it. Okay, Matthew 6, 9 to 10. This is what it says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. And he blows their mind by starting the the prayer with our Father. See, no one had heard anybody relate to God as Father until Jesus. Ever. 
They called him all the other names. You know, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh. Whilst there's nothing wrong with those names, I do want you to realize this. They're more like job descriptions than relationships. When I only pray to God, my healer, he now has to do something for me. Doesn't mean he's not a healer. It just means that I am putting him here and using God as a commodity. See, like I said before, the disciples or disciples without sonship, discipleship without sonship, people will always Take that discipleship and say, what can I get out of? What can I get? All I want is Clark's anointing. If I could only get Clark's anointing. But you don't actually care about the man. You want the gift. So if Clark was in trouble, he's not going to call you. Because you wouldn't care. I'm just putting it out there. That if you only see people as a commodity... And what can I get out of them? We will most likely do that to God too. Because relationship automatically means intimacy. And sonship brings you into a place of intimacy where he can see into you and you can see into him. So this is what Jesus is saying. Now, this is more than a job description, boys. This is relationship. This is a sonship call to change the world. And you can't do that with a servant mentality or a slave mentality. The kingdom of heaven is given as an inheritance to children. And therefore, if the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, who do you think he's going to give it to? Children. To children. You want your business to prosper. It's your inheritance. If you want a city, if you want to take a city, I'm going to tell you crazy stories tonight about how creation responds to us. Okay? But... If you want a city, you have to understand that it's your inheritance. You don't have to get God to like you to give it to you. You just have to receive it. So he says, our father. He goes, Abba, daddy God. And the disciples are like, what? We knew him as this and we knew him as that, but we never called him daddy. Because calling somebody dad's dangerous. Because now it's not just about clean cut relation, you know, clean cut. Here's the box. This is when I use you. This is where we meet. Now it's about constant. There is a dance of heaven that children get to be a part of. It's the rhythm. It's almost like, you know, when God breathed into Adam for that first time. And there was this, there, there was this convergence of breath. It's almost to say this, that every time we breathe, God breathes with us. When Isaiah was, when Ali was preaching here the other night, Isaiah had a little bit too much chocolate. And I had to put him to sleep. And I travel a lot, and so I don't do that a lot. And props to any single parent out there. Praise the Lord for you. Seriously. Like, and that's the truth. I'm telling you, you are a gift. Because I did it for two days. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought, I don't, I, I'm getting more gray hairs by the second. And, and so here, here he is, you know, I've given him his bottle. He's, he's pretty much crashed at this point. But he wasn't going to sleep because he'd have this sugar hit. And so he's lying on the bed and he's playing games with me. Okay? He's playing with my hair. He's pointing on my nose and going, nose. Right? And so he's trying to stay awake as much as he can. And then... There's this moment that happens and he, he puts his head on my shoulder and he just went like that. And then I thought, okay, you know what? I'll move because now I can go watch a movie or something and sneak out and have a cup of tea, you know, just to put some black hair back in my head. And I'm sneaking out and he captures movement. He grabs my shirt and he pulls his cheek up to mine like that. Oops, sorry. His cheek like right there. Right? And his cheek is now on my cheek. Almost to say, Dad, you're not gone anyway. But you know how sometimes the most simple things can be your most profound moment? And I could actually feel him breathe. And there was this time, and it wasn't, I didn't try it. 
But there was this moment where our breath was completely in sync. And at that moment, God said, that's how I am with you. That there was this complete harmony of breath. And the word conspiracy actually means being so close that you share the same breath. See, we're part of a kingdom of heaven conspiracy. We're part of a kingdom of heaven conspiracy simply because we share daddy's breath. And we're so close that, that you can't put that in a box. And so here and I, here's Isaiah and myself, we're sharing each other's breath and we have this divine moment of complete intimacy and complete sonship. I don't do that with other people's kids because that's creepy. But with my own, now we're in sync and I could feel the rhythm of heaven and it was like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, now you've captured the rhythm of heaven. And see, when we share the same breath, that's why when we pray in the name of Jesus, what are we doing? We're giving up our identity of self-sufficiency and stepping into sync with God's breath and who he is. Is that encouraging you today? Sin's not our issue. Sin's been dealt with. Read Hebrews 9 and 10. Sin's been dealt with. One offering for eternity as an eternal inheritance. That's done. No more sin offering. So sin's dealt with. It's our self-sufficiency that's our issue. We always want our own breath. We always say, I want mine. I want, this is mine. I want this. I want that. Notice that even in the story of the prodigal son, that the, that the younger brother enters back into the household almost to say this. Now, when, when he says, when the younger brother says to the father, I want my own thing, what's he doing? He's saying, I don't want to be part of your breath anymore. I don't want this. I don't want to share the same breath. I want my own. I want my own identity outside of you. But what happens when they come back into the tent? There is now a harmony of breath. It's almost to say the father says, come, let's breathe together again. And in that place, you, you don't have to kind of work. It's about actually uncluttering. I'm not adding anything to your spirituality. I'm decluttering the rubbish. You know, it's time to stop praying constipated prayers. It's true. It's a lot of effort and no result. (laughs) We need some spiritual metamucil. Why? Because suddenly now it's as simple as the air that you breathe. And when you become aware of God with every single breath that you take, that's praying without ceasing. In Thessalonians, Paul asks us to do that. It's praying without ceasing. That's ensuring that our breath is in sync with God's, therefore giving us his identity, not fighting for our own. So Matthew 6, 9 to 10, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he goes on. And then after this moment, Jesus then says, give us this day our daily bread. Now that daily bread is not just a meal portion. It's actually a table of reconciliation. But that's not the topic today. But... It's about coming to a place where people have come to reconciliation. But watch how Jesus starts before he asks for anything. Sometimes we go into our prayer time and we just straight up say, give this, give that, I need that, I need this. So we come to a place of provision, not position. Watch how Jesus prays. He says, our Father, which what? Which connotes sonship. He's, by saying, our Father, we're now, I'm your what? I'm your son. Hallowed be your name. What name is he talking about? The name that defines him. Your name defines you, which is what? Your identity. And then he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which, is in it, which was his inheritance. So he first comes into the place of sonship, He then, from that place of sonship, recognizes his identity. From that place, he moves into inheritance and then only does he ask for something. See, before we ever ask God for anything, which he would love to give us, I I believe God loves to give us stuff. God helps me go shopping. Praise the Lord. I'm serious. I get great deals. If you want a sale anointing, I can pray for you. People think I'm joking. 
I'm serious. Well, what I'm saying is this, is that until you recognize your position as a son, your identity as a son, and your inheritance as a son, what you ask for, you'll always wonder if God likes you enough. Because if he doesn't give it, you'll have an identity crisis. Anybody ever prayed for something never got and went, oh my Lord, maybe he's mad. Maybe I didn't pray for long enough. Maybe I need to fast more. Or maybe, I don't know what your, your, the, the filters in your head are, but I realize this, that if I don't get something, God's only going to give me something greater. Because if I say no to Isaiah, it's not because I don't want to bless him. It's because I want to give him something better that he has not no idea yet. That's why it says, your will be done. See, Father's will is far greater than our own. I'm going to tell you right now that God loves you more than you love you. When I was growing up, I just got to make sure. When I was um, growing up that, you know, when I was about eight or nine, in primary school, we had this deal and, and we just thought it was cute. I didn't think, I, I thought it was stupid now, but it was cute then. Was I went to my, to my friends and we thought we were having this name thing and, you know, uh, we were learning about ourselves and family line and everything else. And we thought, how cool would it be to call our parents by their first names? Yeah. <laughs> it's already started bad. And I've gone, you know, I'll, I'll call. Yeah, that's, that's all right. I can do that. And so we went home that day and we were eating dinner. And I said to my dad, whose name is Ian, I said, Dad, serve me some food. I said, thanks, Ian. <laughs> and he kind of gave me this look. Yeah. Now, this might sound really odd, but I, we, I never got a whooping when I was young. I, ne- I never did. I got close to it. I got put in a corner. I got grounded. I got all of that. I got disciplined. But I never had to get a whack simply because my dad looked at me. And I was frozen. There, there was a stare that my dad had. We used to call it dad's big eyes. He'd look at you and you'd be like, oh, Lord Jesus. And so I said, thanks, Ian. And he gave me the look. And I thought, how close is mum? And so he gave me this look and he said, excuse me? And I knew that if I lied, it would have made it worse. He said, so what did you say? I said, thanks, Ian. (laughs) And he said, come over here. And I thought, oh, Lord, there's a first time for everything. (laughs) So I think, oh, Lord. He gets gets down my height. I wasn't a tall kid. (laughs) Um, he, He gets down my height. And he says, when you were a baby... He said, I cleaned your diapers. You vomited on my shirts. I made sure you had everything that you ever wanted. He said, there was one time when you were toilet training. He said, you couldn't make it to the toilet, so I let you pee in my hands. He said, you will call me dad. I said, yes, dad. When you do that, you have the right to be called dad. And I'm telling you right now, the Father God's done a lot more for us than that. He says, call me dad. Call me dad. Relate to me as father. And yes, sometimes that's difficult because we look at our own lives and we say, well, I find it difficult to relate to dad as as God as father because of my own father here and now. But may I say this to you? That in those moments, you have to look at maybe where your earthly father made mistakes and say, but God is the perfect father. And come to a place of reflection. I'm not saying there's not a journey that you have to take. And my, my dad had to take that journey. And if you were here in February, you would have heard all of that. But when you relate to God as dad, you are placing yourself into an inheritance mindset. Where not only is the kingdom yours, but so is all the earth. So is all the provision. So is everything that you need for your life. 
is found in the name Father. That's why Jesus says, pray like this, our Father. In John 17, he says, when he's praying about the disciples and about the followers, he says, I have manifested a name to them. Keep them in your name. What name did Jesus manifest? Father. He didn't manifest any other name. He, he manifested the name Father. And then he says in his prayer, in John 17, I want you to keep them in your name. Keep them in the name. Why? Why? Make sure that they re- re- are constantly reminded yeah. that they're sons and daughters. In Mark 12, 14 to 17, this is, the, this is the challenge of when one of the Pharisees and they challenged Jesus with the mark on the coin. And this is what it says. Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may, I may see it. Now, this is a trick question, and we all know that it's a trick question. The reason they're asking him this is because we're in the beginning, in AD 6, when this, when this particular tax got introduced, historically, there was a man by the name of Judas the Galilean. This is not Judas the disciple. This is Judas the Galilean. And he, he stirred up a revolt against Caesar and started a, a revolutionary, really. He was a revolutionary. And what he said was, we will not pay taxes to Caesar. Well, we all know what happens to people who don't pay taxes to Caesar. He eventually got hunted down and killed along with his followers. So this is the question here is, are you a revolutionary? Because if you say yes, and this is the trick, if you say yes, Rome will kill you and we won't have to deal with you anymore. If you say no... You lose all messianic credibility. So if you, sorry, if you say no to paying this, the tax, you're a revolutionary. If you say yes to paying the tax, you lose all credibility with the people. So what does Jesus say? Let's go to the next slide. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Why would they marvel at him? And why did he say, bring me a coin? And whose image and inscription is this? Let me show you what the image would have looked like. That's what it looked like of Caesar Augustus. But this was the inscription. Caesar Augustus, son of God, father of his country. Whose image and inscription is this? So Jesus shows them, gets the coin and says, well, who owns this? He goes, well, render back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So if Caesar put his image on a coin, that was the power of Caesar. He said, I am king and the son of God. And my power allows me to put my image on a coin. How many times have you seen in movies, the, 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 the place of success is getting your face on a hundred dollar bill. If I could just get my face on money, I've made it. Well, see, Caesar placed his image on a coin and Jesus said, remember, everything Jesus said was kingdom. So when Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he's having a go at Caesar. Because then he says, and render to God the things that are God's. He's having a go at Caesar because he's saying this. This Caesar thinks he's the son of God and all he can put his image on is a coin. And who's listening to him? The Jews. He says, and render the things to God which are God's. In Genesis 1, where did God place his image? On us. He's saying, seriously? This king thinks he's the son of God and all he can put his image on is a coin? You can give that inferior king his inferior money. But you, but you, who has and has been placed on and in with the image of God, you render that image back to God. Why? Because you are already God's. 
He's having a kingdom comparison right here. That if you truly think that this king is that powerful and all he can do is place his image on a coin, then you render that back. But see, this king placed his image on you and you render that back to God. What did it really mean? In Caesar's kingdom, and here's the difference between sonship and discipleship and relationship and function, is is that in Caesar's kingdom, money was the treasured thing and people were a commodity. But in God's kingdom, money is a commodity and people are treasured. When I talk about the fivefold, and I really do honor the fivefold, I believe it's a function, but it's not my identity. When I, went, when I was struggling with this, and I was pretty confused because all these prophetic people are coming to me and saying, you're this and you're that. And I got even more confused because I didn't know who I was. And so I went to Clark and I said, Clark, what do I do with this? Because I'm confused. And he gave me this look that just, he just said everything in the look. He went, Oh my gosh. He goes, don't listen to that rubbish. You just do what God tells you to do. And, that'll, and, then, and, that, and that's the end of it. He goes, when you go to a place, don't think about what office you're in. Just go and do what God says to do. And then I was reminded of when Jesus says this, I only do what I see the Father do. He never said, my office allows me to do this. He just does what he sees the Father do. And it's the same thing with us. We only do what we see the Father do. That's it. And so that apostolic calling, that prophetic calling, that evangel- evangelical calling is only a function of sonship. Remember this. And if, this, if nothing else gets through to you, remember this. That your gifting and that, that, that calling of yours is a function of identity, not the other way around. Anyone that finds their identity and their gifting is really annoying. <laughs> You guys know who I'm talking about. Everybody's going, I know that person. <laughs> Why? Because now everything they do has to manifest the gift. Everything. Everything they do. See, people with title issues have entitlement issues. That's a word. Of course you will. Because your whole person is a title. Take the title away. Do you know how many times I've been willing to hand back the title of pastor? At least a few times a year. I'm like, Lord, I I can do something else. I am more than happy to do something else. But you know what? In that place of abandonment of self, I felt completely secure. I don't need Reverend Bishop Pope title. I don't. And I actually really like this Pope. But what I'm saying is I don't need that title. If you look on Facebook, there's all these people that try to friend me. And they have all these, you know, really fancy names. And fancy titles, apostle, this and this. And then they're so apostolic, they keep asking me for money. I'm sorry. Apostles are chased by money. Why? Because you understand how to make it. You understand how to receive it. If you're an apostle and you keep asking for money, there's something that, you know, and I'm not saying you can't receive money. I'm saying, but they, I mean, they just put blanket messages out. It's like, whoa. So people love to self-title. Because they find their identity in it. But you don't have to call me Bishop, Reverend, anything. You just call me Andrew. Jesus was just Jesus. Because he knew he was safe in his identity. He functioned as a teacher and as a rabbi. But he was Jesus, the son of God. He knew himself as son. Not anything else. You can, when God speaks to you, most likely, and I would say this. He's not impressed by your title. He doesn't go, oh my gosh, they've done their doctorate. And I actually, I, I'm all for education. I have an education. I love tertiary education. I'm going back to do my master's. My brother's doing his PhD next year. So my family grew up, you know, in education. But that doesn't impress God. It's not, he doesn't go, wow, they're a doctor. I'll give them more miracles because they've got a doctor of how to lay carpet or something. You know, I'll give them more miracles. They've they got a title. That's not bad. He's my son. I'll give him miracles. That's my daughter. I'll give him prophetic words. You are a child of God, full stop. And God, you you realize this, that whatever the king treasures, he places his image on. Whatever the king treasures, that's you and me. 
as children of God. That's, that's what we're treasured by God. Okay. Remember when Judah sells Jesus out for 30 coins? For 30 silver coins? What coins do you think they were? What was Judas doing? You know, Judas and Peter had a lot in common. Actually, Peter and Judas didn't do that, do that much different. Think about it. They didn't do it. I mean, they both denied Jesus and they just did, you know, they, they, they did something really mean. But Peter didn't try to fix it with a good work. Remember, Judas tries to give the coins back. Peter follows Jesus even in the midst of it. Even in the midst of his failure, he's still following Jesus, maybe at a distance. But he knew that a good work doesn't fix a failure. A good God fixes a failure. It's not about going from bad to good. It's going from good to God. And so Judas tries to fix it with a good work. Take the money back. I, he, for that moment, he switched kingdoms. Realize this. What did he do? He looked at an inferior image and said, I find my identity in this. And I'll sell out for that. Judas didn't sell Jesus out. He sold himself out. And so Judas hangs himself. Peter gets restored. Why? And, I mean, and you know that people love Peter because how many Peters are sitting in this church? Just seriously, how many Judases are? When was the last time you looked at a baby and went, wow, they just look like a Judas? Why? Like, why do we do that? Peter messed up just as bad. Think about it. Peter messed up just as bad. So did David. They, all me- they, they messed up. But no one names their kid Judas because there was something that happened in that man where he traded for an inferior kingdom and lost himself in it. Because he treated Jesus like a commodity, not as a son. In Acts 3, let's read this together. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, and they, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him and John, John and Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from, from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. And everybody knew he was the beggar at the gate. What coins was he asking for? What coin was he asking for? Well, there was a temple tax that they only used in the temple, which was a coin, which was a coin from Herod. But you've got to realize this layman wasn't allowed in the temple. So what arms actually ca- carried value in the city? The denarius, a Roman coin. What coin was he asking for? The one with Caesar on it. So now we have a layman sitting just beyond the gate, asking for an image that is inferior. Peter comes along and says this, silver and gold I do not have. I don't carry this inferior image that you're asking for. I don't have it. But what I do have But what I do have, the image of God, the identity of God, I carry his name, which means I bear the same authority that he does. Here's the difference between image and identity and why both have to work. And image and name. Has anyone ever seen, you know, the celebrities that adopt children? All right. They don't look necessarily like the celebrity. But what happens when they get adopted? They transfer what? Name. Which means now that child that had nothing has everything, not because they look the same, but actually because they now carry the same name. We get the best of both. We carry the image 
and the name. That's why Paul said it's a spirit of adoption. Because your image got marred when Adam fell. But it was fully restored when Jesus reversed the curse. So yes, the image was restored, but now the name defines us. So, G- so Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. I don't carry the coin that you think is going to perpetuate your lameness. But what I do have, the image and the identity of the superior king, I now give to you. The man that was lame was lame for over 40 years. That's why later in the story you realize that they say, bring his parents in. Bring his parents in. We want them to vouch for him. Now, why would they call his parents in when everybody's seen him lame? Now, one of the, big, one of the, the cultural things that they did was beggars had like permission to beg. So they actually had, and I don't know if you've ever heard this from Shane before, but they, there was a shawl that they had, like a prayer shawl, but it was, a, it was one that identified them as a, as a beggar. So, and it would have covered him. So when he got up leaping and praising, that old identity fell off. And then they call in his parents. Now, where do we get our identity from? Our parents. Why do they call? What, what were they doing? They were saying, this is not an earthly identity. This didn't just come from you. Something's happened. That's why they said, yeah, he, he was laying. I, I, we, it, this has happened. Something superseded the identity that they gave him because God had now restored the fullness of the identity from the beginning. So now we have an, a man that's over 40. Why is this important? Because 40 years speaks of a generation. 40 years speaks of a generation. And I would say this prophetically. There is a generation that has been lame sitting at outside the temple because They've lived under an inferior, inferior identity that only perpetuated lameness. But we, those that don't live under that inferior kingdom, need to restore identity and wholeness will come. We need to be the voices and the carriers of this superior identity so that when we go out there, we can restore not just a great gift, we can restore their identity as children of God. And then he went leap, le- leaping and jumping and praising the Lord. Yeah. Why? Because his identity had now made him whole. You and I are carriers of a superior image. And like I said, we're talking about identity now. We, we'll talk about the authority that comes with it tonight. But you and I are carriers of this superior image. An image that makes people whole. Simply because we're not commodities to God. We're not commodities. God just didn't need a workforce, so he created humanity. He was already in perfection, in harmony, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He designed us to love us and to make us part of that dance or part of that family where we would share his breath. We're not striving for something we've already been given. We just have to stop, breathe, and receive. So I would ask us to, to do this. Take a moment right now. Why don't you close your eyes? And we're just going to become aware of the breath of God. And we'll become aware that we're children of God. See, in the inferior kingdom, we, we can struggle with things from it. If I could have the musicians up here, please. Things like anger, greed, bitterness, rejection, inferiority, even physical illness. See, that's from an inferior kingdom where where we're made to feel like a commodity. But actually, when we look up like the lame man did, He had to look up to Peter. When we look up to the one that carries our true identity. And we receive that identity as a child of God. You and I can leap and praise and thank the Lord for his goodness. 
That healing and wholeness is part of your inheritance. You don't need to pray harder to get it. You actually have to just stop and be and just receive it. Lord, right now over every single person here that might have felt like the person at the gate that has a basket full of inferior coins that perpetuate a life that has, that, that's really just an existence. God, today, I pray that you allow them to look up at you, the restorer of their true identity. Lord, right now, that over that moment in their life, that this doesn't just change their life, but it's an encounter that changes their whole family life. Lord, today, over every family here, I pray that your identity, your name seals us, that your family line is now our family line, and that the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, that we would freely receive it. Because, Father, it is your good pleasure to give us a free gift to give us the kingdom so we stop, breathe, and receive. For every person that's having family um, financial issues or family issues, Lord, may the inheritance of perfect provision and peace come into their homes. For those that have health issues, may that position of wholeness restore them. Lord, today, we declutter, unclutter, and come into that place of just being with you, being a child in the kingdom, and letting that be our, our identifier, not anything else. We scrap the titles. We scrap the finding, trying to find self-worth, self-sufficiency. And Lord, we abandon ourselves to the loving Father and his heart for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Come on, let's put our hands together and just receive the word. Amen. Receive that word this morning. That was awesome. Awesome. I, I had a moment when you were sharing about, um, you know, holding Isaiah. Did you watch NCIS? Who watches NCIS? You know, like, remember when Agent David's father was shot, if you've seen it, and she screamed out. But I never got this until then because she's Hebrew, of course. He was, he was Israeli as well. And she held him and she screamed, Abba, 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 Abba. You know, and she's holding him. I went, I lost the rest of the program because I realized that closeness that you described this morning is what all of us have access to. The access of a father, Abba, Father. Something in us cries out, Abba, Father, Father. There's something. But when you give your heart to Jesus, come on, let's just stand for a moment. We, we're going to finish. We're way over time. I apologize. It was his fault. And... Um, and so don't blame me, just blame him. And, um, but, but we just, we just love, uh, I, I love that Father right now, Abba. I just want you to say that word. It's a Hebrew word. Abba. Abba just means Father. I don't know what that conjures up in your world. It may conjure up some really not nice memories. But your memories are not Father God. And his presence is in this place right now. Maybe you've never been connected to him. But Jesus paid the price of that connection. And maybe this morning, I want, it was a weird altar call, but I want you to just lift your hands where you are and say, I need to be connected to the Father. I need my breath. I need my life to be in sync. I'm breathing too much on my own. It may, you, you know, you may be, have given your heart to the Lord years and years ago, but recognize even in rebellion, even there's something that always wanted to be out of step. But this morning, you suddenly realized, Abba, there's a breath. When God breathed into his creation, he breathed on him, breathed and gave him life. When the wind of Pentecost came, he breathed into the church, synchronized his breath, gave you a new identity. Who wants that identity this morning? I've got my hand way up. I tell you, Abba Father, dearest Daddy, Well, Father, I bless each and every one this morning, every hand that's been lifted, every heart that's been opened. 
Lord, I thank you for your word. It's powerful. Lord, we thank you for the message that you're bringing through Andrew and Ali. We thank you for them as a family and we bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Go and have a great lunch and, uh, and go and have a, yeah, amen. Let's just clap the Lord and clap Andrew and bless the Father. God bless. Six o'clock tonight, we're going to have a great time. Amen.